Okay, I think uh, we've got the technology uh, sorted out, so I'm going to I'm going to start, and I just want to talk about about the ILO, about how we got to where we are really with the ileal pouch. Um, so just to make sure we're all on the sort of same page here, what are we talking about? We're talking about surgery where you remove the whole of the colon and the rectum, so the whole of the large bowel, um, and replace it with a reservoir made from small bowel, the small bowel here. Um, and who are the sorts of patients who need this kind of surgery or who, for whom this surgery is uh, appropriate? Well, people who have a problem which means that they need to have their colon and rectum removed. Okay? Um, uh, if you need only your colon removing, you can keep your rectum. You can, have, you can be joined together with what we call an ileorectal anastomosis. Um, if you, to need a pouch, you need to have both the colon and the rectum removed. Um, you need to have healthy small bowel because that pouch needs to be, is made of small bowel and it needs to be healthy and it's a bit bonkers to actually try and make a pouch out of small bowel that's not healthy. And you need a pretty healthy anal canal because our anuses are designed for holding on to solid poo that's sitting in a rectum. They're not designed for holding on to a liquid poo in a pouch. So those are the sort of requirements really for needing a pouch. And most of the patients who meet those requirements are people with ulcerative colitis. Um, and that's the vast majority of people who end up having ileoanal pouch surgery. And roughly a third of people with ulcerative colitis end up needing surgery at some stage in their lives. Another big group, particularly here, is people with familial adenomatous polyposis. That's uh, an inherited condition wh which we specialise in here, where you inherit a very high risk of bowel cancer and lots and lots of polyps. And in some patients, the only way to deal with that is to remove the whole of the large bowel to prevent cancer. Uh, and those people often benefit from a pouch. And then there are a few assorted other people who under special circumstances may need to have their whole large bowel removed and, and, might, and might be a, um, a, a pouch might be appropriate for them. So let's think about ulcerative colitis because that's really where this all started. All right? that's, the first pouches were done for ulcerative colitis. It's where the biggest patient numbers come from. It's where the real drive has come from to develop this operation. Let's go right back to the turn of the previous century, late 1800s, early 1900s. This is statistics from the London hospitals, all very respectable institutions. These are admissions for acute colitis, and this is the number of patients who died. This is before steroids, this was before antibiotics, before effective intravenous fluids. People died. If, if you were bad enough with your ulcerative colitis, you needed to go to hospital you stood a roughly 50-50 chance of not getting back out again. Now, that we would be horrified by that now. If we have somebody who dies of acute colitis, which occasionally happens, but only occasionally, it is a major, a major thing, okay, because it should not happen now. But only a little over 100 years ago, it did happen. So... Um, Surgeons turned their minds to seeing if they could try and stop this. And uh, one of the first things that was uh, pioneered was just making a stoma, bringing out an ileostomy above the diseased colon uh, and just letting it rest. Um, most of the people who, who do die of acute colitis die because of bowel perforation, actually, colon perforation. That's usually what happens. Um, uh, or extreme dehydration. Well, if you can bring out an ileostomy above the very diseased colon, you can you can um, salvage that situation. Um, but dangerous, before the days of safe anaesthetic, um, and still carried a quite significant mort mortality. This is now looking at the 1930s data from the Mayo Clinic, one of the smartest and best clinics in America. Still, we're getting 30% of people dying, having had an ileostomy for acute colitis. Um, so they then thought, well, uh, the problem is this horrible diseased bit of colon. Why don't we remove it? Um, now, that's a pretty big operation even nowadays. But then, 1930s, before good anaesthetics, I mean, anaesthetics at that point was still a wedge of cotton wool with some chloroform on it, you know, quite dodgy anaesthetics, uh, and no antibiotics at all. Um, they actually, by removing the diseased colon, got their mortality down to about 10% which is pretty amazing, really. 
in the, in the circumstances. Around this sort of time, the 1930s, was also around the time when people started to use steroids to treat ulcerative colitis, which obviously made a huge difference as well. Uh, this is also from America, and again, this is looking at the um, um, data for removing the colon. Their, their rates weren't quite so good, 20% mortality, one in five people dying. But it gets much better after 90, in the early 19. 50s, and that's probably because of the anaesthetics, intravenous fluids, and antibiotics, which arrived at that point and made a huge difference to outcomes from surgery. Um, so things are getting better. Um, and again, this is another one. Uh, this is Canada, uh, and they actually managed 1948, 20 patients, no operative mortality at all. So good, very good, good progress. But uh, this is what an ileostomy looked like in... I, I've never managed to date this. This is, this is an old St. Mark's photograph, and um, we kind of think it's probably the 1930s or possibly 1940s. Don't we, Lisa? We've sort of discussed this, haven't we? We don't quite know when that photograph comes from, but it's that kind of era. Um, uh, and that's pretty grim, isn't it? Um, uh, we need to be very grateful to Danzac and all the wonderful other companies uh, who have worked to um, produce better stoma appliances. It's all to do with materials, I think, the adhesives, the bags, um, etc. Uh, so obviously that wasn't really what people uh, wanted to be, and they were very glad to be alive, but you know, uh, this was a bit of a downside. Uh, so uh, how are we going to avoid that? Um, so this chap, uh, and again American, Divine, thought, well, can we save the rectum uh, and do a col an ileorectal anastomosis? Can we c take the colon out, but then join people up? And then he had this weird operation, which involved about four stages, where he made these what he called blowholes, which was basically multiple stomas when the person was acutely ill, like this. Um, and then when they were better, um, he would go in and take the colon out and join the ileum to the rectum. Um, the problem with doing that is that the rectum is, as anybody who's got ulcerative colitis will know, is actually involved with the disease. And very often you, keep, you get rid of the colon, but you actually have terrible inflammation in the rectum, terrible proctitis. And if you couple that with having no colon above it and just having liquid feces coming straight from the small bowel straight into this diseased rectum, you have terrible urgency and frequency and impaired continence. There are some patients who seem to have a bit of what we call rectal sparing, where their rectum's actually not bad. And particularly if, if it responds to steroid enemas, that kind of thing, and the rectum is it can be treated and behave itself, then actually you can get away with an ileorectal anastomosis, leaving the rectum. But it's a bit unpredictable. We do occasionally do it now um, uh, for various reasons, and particularly in children, it seems to work quite well. Um, and there's, uh, in Scandinavia, they're quite keen on it. And I think we're going to start trying to do some research on working out which patients may actually do well from this operation. Um, it's, it's kind of gone through phases where in the 1940s it was, it was a, considered a good option because there wasn't much else available. Then when the pouch came along it was considered you know, actually not the right thing to do at all because so many people struggled. But there are, there are some people who do all right and uh, you don't actually lose much by trying it out, in fact, other than having an operation. Um, because um, you can always do a pouch afterwards if you need to. Um, so that is something that's quite interesting. Anyway, so he did that, but it didn't, you know, a lot of people did not do well. Oops. Um, then uh, Ravitch decided uh, that, okay, the problem is the uh, diseased rectum, so why don't we just join the small bowel, the healthy small bowel, straight onto the anus? And he did this ileoanal anastomosis, where he just took the end of the small bowel and just joined it onto the anus. Uh, and that had pretty dismal results as well in terms of high frequency and poor continence and a very, very sore bottoms. These are some of the diagrams he drew, and I'm particularly fond of this one. Because what he's done is he's brought the small bowel down to the pelvis. There is the anus. And he's, he's joined it onto the anus, the end of the small bowel. Here it is, a bit like a hose coming down, and it is about the size of a, a hose, the small bowel. 
golden hose, here it comes down, and he's joining it to the anus. But what's interesting about this is the way this is coiled up in the pelvis. It's almost trying to be a pouch. What he hasn't done is join the pieces together to make a bag. He's just got them sort of looped on top of each other. And all he needed to do was to join these together, and he had a pouch. But he didn't. But that diagram is so nearly a pouch, it's amazing. Anyway, this uh, did, he did a few, and they didn't really do very well at all, very poor quality of life, so that was sort of thrown out as an idea. Then separately, Nils Koch in Sweden um, thought, well, let's just make this ileostomy, let's go back to the ileostomy, let's try and make the ileostomy better. So he decided to create this reservoir or pouch um, upstream of an ileostomy so that you didn't have to wear a bag and have continuous drainage. What you did was inserted a catheter a few times a day and emptied the pouch. And in between times, you just wore a dressing over the stoma. So this is a patient using a Medina catheter to catheterize their cock pouch. And in between times, they just have nothing, just a dressing over it. And it's continent. It's made to be continent. This is what it actually looks like. It's made from loops of small bowel joined together. And then the, 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 um, this part is, is, is turned inside it on itself to make like a pressure nipple valve. And the idea is that as this fills up and expands, it compresses the valve and stops it leaking. And this is brought to the outside world to make the stoma. And these are brilliant. Um, I don't know any, ever, anybody in here has had one or got one. Um, they are fantastic when they work. The problem with them is, is that they have a really, really, really high failure rate. And when they fail, it can be very spectacular. You can get to a, a situation where suddenly you cannot get a tube in there. And you go from being completely fine to being totally obstructed. And unless you are at a hospital where they know how to deal with this, there is a very big problem very quickly. The other way they go wrong is that this continent valve thing slips and stops being continent and uh, this uh, leaks all the time. Um, uh, and you can redo it, but the redo, the redo failure rate is really high. And they do virtually all fail at some stage. So we've stopped doing them just because it's, you know, it's, it's un unacceptably high. The fact, but when they are working, they are really good. And the people who've had them that, that function well have been very pleased with them. It's just that they, come to a, they sort of come to a rather spectacular and unpleasant end at some point when, they, when you, can't, um, you can't intubate it and end up in a hospital uh, as an emergency where they don't know how to deal with it. Anyway, but the, the, the thing that this man did was make a pouch. So all it took was... John Nichols and um, Alan Parks from St Mark's to put the two ideas together and to take the pouch that Nils Cock had made and put it in the pelvis like Ravitch did with his end ileostomy. Uh, and there you are, the ileoanal pouch. Um, the original ones were all joined on uh, down here by hand sewing, which is technically very difficult to do. Um, uh, and not that many surgeons can do that. Uh, we do do it here, but not many people can do it. Um, and doing the hand sewing um, can damage the anus and, and impair continence a little bit because you have to open the anus to be able to do the stitching, a bit like that, and that stretches the muscles, which isn't good. So we've tried to get away from that. Um, the other thing that's changed over the years is the pouch configuration. As you will see, the sharp-eyed amongst you will see that this is an S pouch. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a minute, another picture in a minute, but this is an S pouch, which was the original pouch configuration. And you can see here it's got this little bit coming out of it, because this is made like a cock pouch, really. And that bit used to be, for a cock pouch, would be the ileostomy coming out through the tummy wall. In an ileoanal pouch, they just joined that onto the anus. The trouble with this is that this is a bit of a narrowing. And as this pouch fills, it kinks and blocks the outlet. So the first pouches that were S pouches all needed to have the patient put a Medina catheter in through the anus to empty it, okay, because of this bit here. So S pouches are um, uh, needed modification. So what's been going on in the last 35 years? Well, we've tried to refine the indications. Who is this a good operation for and who is it not? Technical aspects, 
uh, the shape of the pouch, how we do the join, those sorts of things have been refined. Predicting the outcome. You know, people coming for an operation want to know what to expect. And we've tried to understand that. And the way we've done that is by intensively following people up for a long time. But we still have to remember the first pouch was only done in 1978. So when people say to me, how long will my pouch, pouch last? I don't know. I know that the you know, original, the first few pouches done uh, are uh, still functioning, some of them. I saw, I think, number 11 or something the other day, came to clinic, um, uh, uh, actually with problems. But uh, you know, some of those original pouches are still, are still up and running. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's still only since the 1980s, really, that these have been done, done in any, any number. We've also got our heads around the compl complications of pouch failure and salvage surgery, what you do about complications, how to diagnose them and what to do. And, and a big part of what I do uh, is to try and uh, um, move that forward. Uh, so um, this projector is terrible. It's the projector, not the slides. It's, it's very dim. Um, but just a few technical things just for interest. Most people nowadays will actually have a J pouch. Uh, this chap. Uh, it's on a mirror who's still alive and around uh, in, in uh, Japan um, decided, it designed this and it's much simpler than the uh, other configurations and it's the one we mainly use now. You just take, it's obvious, it's a J shape, you just um, uh, bend it back on itself like that and join the two bits together and the bit that joins onto the anus is the, is the apex of the pouch so you don't have that thin bit that kinks. Uh, so most people who have a J pouch can um, empty without using a catheter. So this is the original S pouch. That's why if you put your head on one side, you can see why it's called an S. It uses three, three loop bits of bowel joined together. And this is the problem bit, this bit that sticks out called the efferent limb. And that's where you join onto the anus. And this is the bit that makes it difficult to empty. This is a J pouch, which is what we do mainly now. Nice and simple, easy to do and um, uh, that is joined onto the anus. And John Nichols used to do a W pouch, so most John Nichols pouches are Ws, which is phenomenally complicated because it uses four pieces of bowel. You have to hand sew all of these joins, you can't use a stapler, it takes ages and is really confusing. Um, and I always think that if something is confusing and difficult for the surgeon, uh, it's not a good thing for you. Um, it, it looks easy in two dimensions like this, but when you, it's actually three-dimensional. And, and so it's a bit like making a football out. You know, if you look at a football, it's all made of panels. So you get these four pieces of bowel and you open them up and then you've got these panels and you have to work out in what order to join them together. And I find it very difficult. Um, uh, it makes a bigger pouch, which some people say might, might, might improve function, but there's no good evidence for that at all. Uh, so most people now just have a J. The next uh, controversy is how you do the join. Um, here's a J pouch. This is the anus. Um, there's the outside world down there. Um, this, this little bit of, of bowel here is important. This is where the skin, when you're made as an embryo, your skin, there's a sort of skin dimple here that grows inside, inside and then uh, joins the bottom of the bowel. Um, and, uh, this is quite an important, the area just above there is really important for sensation. It, this is the area where, you know, if you're sitting there at the back and you're thinking, you know, do I need to poo? Do I need to fart? Do I, you know, that, it's here. It's this. That's all happening right there. That distinction between wind and liquid poo and solid pool poo is all happening there. And you, it's quite important for your function to retain that so that your brain can know what's, what's going on. Um, yeah, we have what we call a sampling reflex, where these muscles just relax a little bit every now and again, subconsciously, to let whatever's in your rectum or your pouch just trickle down here a little bit to be sampled and tested so that you know where you're at and what you need to do next. Um, if you do a hand-sewn anastomosis, hand-sewn join, you have to strip away this area, or at least most of it, so you lose some of that sensation. Okay, So that's a downside of a hand-sewn anastomosis. The upside is that if you've got ulcerative colitis or polyposis, this patch of bowel is affected by that disease. So it can be, it can be inflamed in, in ulcerative colitis. You might hear about people talking about the cuff. This is the cuff. And if you have cuffitis, it basically means you've still got ulcerative colitis of this little bit that's been left behind. So you don't want it too long. Okay? Um, so the argument for removing it is that you get rid of the disease that's there. 
So like all these things, there's a compromise, and surgeons like to go away to conferences and argue and shout at each other about what's the right thing to do. My, my compromise is that, provided this is reasonably healthy and, and you know, um, doesn't have precancerous change or something, then I, keep, keep it, but not too much of it. If it's unhealthy, then you need to take it away. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Something very strange has happened to those. Don't worry, that was just showing a staple gun. Uh, right, uh, I'm not going to really bore you with this, but people have all, you know, they're always trying to prove what's better, a hand sewn or a stapled anastomosis. There's been lots of trials. There's been what we call a meta-analysis where you lump all the trials together and do some clever maths and try and find the truth. Um, and basically, there's not much difference, to be honest, between the two in terms of function, other than it's that there's definitely more seepage in people who've had a hand sewn join probably because of the lack of that sensation because that sensation is working even when you're asleep and because of the muscles are stretched when you do a hand sewn join um, but otherwise there really isn't much difference between the two okay no difference in complications maybe slightly better function with a staple but with the hand sewn you uh, reduce the, the disease uh, potential disease complications um, what else do we spend time thinking about whether you need an ileostomy or not. Normally, most people with a pouch get a temporary loop ileostomy. Here's the pouch. Uh, there's lots of joinery here that can leak. The join between the pouch and the anus, the join between the bits of the pouch. Uh, joins, when I, people talk about leaks in bowel surgery, you know, I often think, poor patients must think we're, you know, we're some kind of incompetent plumbers. You know, if the plumber came to your house and did a bit of plumbing, and then it leaked. You know, you would, you'd want your money back, wouldn't you? It's, you know, it's not, but it's not, it's, not, it's not like that. It's not like joining pipes together. All of these joins are, in fact, just wounds. And if you, if you think about when you have a skin wound, any kind of skin wound, um, a surgical one, or you cut yourself and get some stitches, you hope that it will heal beautifully and that um, the stitches will come out and it'll heal as a nice neat line but you know that sometimes that doesn't happen and sometimes a patch of the skin will die back leaving an area that takes longer to heal and creates a bit of an ugly scar that's what a leak is on the inside if a bit of this just hasn't got quite enough good blood supply and it just dies back in the bowel it creates a hole and if there's poo in the bowel it'll come out through the hole into the tummy and give you peritonitis. So that's what an anastomotic leak is. So it's not us surgeons kind of not checking our joints properly or you know, not doing the right thing with the solder. Um, it's, it's, it's your fault for not healing properly. Um, no, we have to make sure that there, we, there's good blood supply and no tension on the joints, that's part of our job, but it does just happen. Um, and the idea of the temporary ileostomy like this is it stops the poo going down here so that if you do have a leak, it doesn't matter so much and uh, you can let, relax, let it heal, uh, make sure it has healed before you then close the ileostomy. Some surgeons say that's not necessary and of course having an ileostomy can have some complications, you can get dehydrated, you have to have another operation to close it, that can have complications, so hey why not let's just not do it. Well we know that uh, that's fine if you don't leak but if you do leak um, then you have uh, a, a, a hot, well, if you don't have an ileostomy, you have a much higher chance of having a leak that's obvious and you have a much higher chance of getting a problem in your pelvis. And these are quite small percentages of patients, so for 90% of people, people, they are actually fine without an ileostomy. Uh, the trouble is, if you're in the, in the group that uh, you don't have an ileostomy and you do have a leak, then you have potentially quite bad long-term consequences. For that reason, I, I almost always do an ileostomy, um, but some surgeons don't, um, and again, it's quite contentious. Um, we have a national database. This is now very out of date, this slide. There are probably about 6,000 pouches in the UK now. Uh, they're not all on this database because it's a voluntary thing. Uh, the biggest centres have contributed to it. And it's from here that we get the numbers that we tell people. Uh, I tell people that they could expect to go to the toilet on average five times a day and once at night with an ileoanal pouch. But there is quite wide variation. Um, and you can see as, as time goes out after the surgery, um, uh, it doesn't change a very great deal and these bars give you an idea of how much people vary around that um, around that figure and 95% of people will lie between 
lie along somewhere along this black bar. So for, you know there are a number there are people who have worse frequency than this. Okay, 2.5% of people above and 2.5% of people uh, will be below statistically. So you know one in 50 patients with a pouch will have a frequency higher than 10 times. Um, which is a problem. That was 24 hour frequency. This is night time, just night time. And again, there are a few people who have <coughs> really very high night time frequency. And I think it's quite grim to have to get up many times at night to go to the toilet. Um, I don't really know what's happened. I don't know whether it's the projector or the software. I use these slides all the time and they seem to be being slightly eaten. I'm sorry about this, but anyway. Uh, seepage seems to, uh, seems to increase. Uh, as time goes by, and this is probably due to ageing, uh, weakening of muscles, and I think probably we're going to see over the next few years what happens as people age with the pouch, and I think there may well be an increasing problem with continence. Uh, and that's nighttime seepage, same sort of thing. So roughly one in ten people have some nighttime seepage, and it does seem to go up with time. Uh, those are just short term complications that we see. Wound infections, leaks are the main ones long-term complications. Won't bore you with that. Pouch failure is something, pouch failure is defined as having an ileostomy that is considered permanent. You don't have to have the pouch removed. There are people who've got an, ileos an ileostomy and a pouch they're not using and there's no prospect of them using that pouch. So they would count as pouch failure. Uh, this is da data from St Mark's which shows that this is years following the pouch and this is the percentage of people with pouch failure. It's a sort of steady thing that just keeps on going up and roughly at, at 10 years it's about 10 percent 15 years it's about 15 percent and I think that's probably right and I think we you know that's a uh, roughly one percent per year is probably the failure rate um, these are our figures and why they failed again mainly infection poor function and pouchitis is a player there um, and we can see that some of the problems are a problem early on. Um, so uh, things like leakage and infection are a problem early on when you first have your pouch and because they occur after the surgery because of leaks and obviously as time goes by they're less as a problem. And then things like Crohn's disease, if you actually have a misdiagnosis and, and turn out to have Crohn's disease that then affects the pouch, that actually takes a bit of time to become apparent. Um, and there are people who just have poor function, that's this red line which as time goes by, there's nothing else wrong with the pouch, but the function is just not good enough and they end up preferring to go back to an ileostomy. So that's how we get this information, and this is what I tell people who are thinking about a pouch. There's a 1% to 2% risk in men of damaging the nerves that work the bladder and penis. Uh, you can expect, on average, to open the pouch five times a day and once at night, but that's an average. Some do less and some more. Roughly 1 in 10 to 1 in 5 might need, get some seepage and need to wear a pad and that will get worse as you get older. About 50% of people have minor treatable problems. The old episode of pouchitis, the old episode of incontinence, the old problem that can, is pretty easily dealt with. But uh, uh, roughly 1% a year, so 10% at 10 years will have pouch failure. And I think another 2 in 10 probably struggle with quite difficult problems but would prefer to struggle on than go to an ileostomy. We know that there are higher risk groups, Crohn's disease, if you get Crohn's disease in the pouch that's a disaster. People with a thing called indeterminate colitis which basically is that the pathologist hasn't got enough information to know whether it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. People who have ulcerative colitis but have other things, particularly primary sclerosis and cholangitis, that's a sort of inflammation and scarring in the liver which weirdly seems to have a bad impact on the pouch and give people bad pouchitis. And there are certain people with polyposis who have things called desmoids, which are sort of fibrous tumours. Uh, those are quite bad news if they're combined with a pouch. We know that the quality of life is very good. I'm not going to bore you with that. And the, bo the bottom line <laughs> is that's what it's for. It's a quality of life operation. It has no medical purpose and indeed creates medical problems. Um, uh, and it, you know it's really important that it, 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 if you're going to go through the, 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 the difficulties of having a pouch that you um, that it does actually deliver the better of quality, quality of life than an ileostomy um, and I think there are people out there who struggle with very poor pouch function who are never really offered an ileostomy as a, 
as a, as a way out. Um, and you know, it's important for people to be able to make that choice because most people who have a pouch have had an ileostomy and know what it was like. Um, and obviously it's important that we make sure pouches function as well as they can, but there are definitely some people who are better off back with an ileostomy. The trouble is predicting those. If you can know who those were beforehand, you wouldn't make a pouch in the first place for them. Uh, but uh, we still don't know, although we may be slowly working towards some ways of working out who those people are to start with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Penny. Has anybody got any questions? I've got one. Um, oh, how sorry, questions. Yes, sorry. Sorry. It's okay. Um, if, if the pouch fails, um, I know that there are two options which are either to remove it or to leave it uh, dysfunctioned. Do you have a, an opinion about which is the best option and why? Um, it's, that is a very, very difficult question because there is no evidence. We like evidence. We like to be able to have some kind of backup and, pr and sort of proof for what we advise and there's virtually none. Um, one of the biggest pouch centres in the world is Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio in America. And they say that you should just remove the pouch, always. I hate removing pouches. It's my least favourite operation. It's a very destructive operation with high complication rates. Particularly in men, uh, I said there when you make a pouch there's a 1-2% to 2 risk of damage to the nerves that, that um, uh, operate ejac uh, ejaculation and erection. That risk is much, much, much higher in pouch excision. It's probably 25%. Um, so it depends on the circumstances. The other thing is that people, there are timing issues. You know, some people are pretty desperate with very bad pouch function, but just want to get out of trouble, get back to their job, get back to their life, get back to their kids or whatever it is. And while it may be that they will have the pouch out in future, they just want to have the quickest, safest, easiest operation now to get out of trouble. Some people can't quite decide what to do and don't want to burn their bridges, so keep the you know, would rather keep the pouch in so theoretically it could go back in use. Uh, and I also think that you reduce the complications of taking out a pouch if it has been out of use for a few months first. So usually what I do is that I suggest that we just make an ileostomy. We just connect, disconnect the bowel above the pouch and leave it in place and see what happens. Let the person get well, let them decide what they want to do and if the pouch is troublesome then we can go ahead and take it out and I think we've created a less complicated situation and we've also created a situation where they can pick their time because they're not in trouble, they're back to being well and they can choose a convenient time to have it done. Um, some people are completely fine with the pouch just sitting there. Some people have symptoms, it, it, particularly people who have incontinence. I've noticed that people <coughs> whose main problem with their pouch is incontinence, if you just make an ileostomy and leave the pouch, the pouch fills up with mucus and they're inc often inc incontinent of large volumes of mucus. So actually that is one group where I think they all need the pouch out so we may as well do it straight away. Um, but pretty much everybody else um, I, I would, I would um, suggest that we make an ileostomy first and see how we go. It, it, we do see occasional long-term problems with pouches, uh, the outlet narrowing and the thing filling with pus and people feeling dreadful, um, and occasional cancers. So I don't know what the right answer is, and I think it's probably something that you need to discuss with each patient and be frank with them about the fact we don't, there isn't a right answer and we need to choose what's right for them um, and uh, do it that way. I'm always very suspicious of doctors who use the words never or always because I don't think those are appropriate words to be using in medicine. Very rarely are they. Uh, is there any difference in function between a J and a W? No, nobody's ever managed to prove it. <laughs> Which is why we all do Js, because there's no 
evidence. They're certainly bigger Ws. Um, it's one of these confusing things about medicine and studies. The trouble is it's what we call confounded because virtually all of the surgeons who did W pouches also did hand-sewn anastomosis. And most of the people who do J pouches do stapled. And th you can see no difference between the two, but it may be that, that the, what you're gaining by having a J pouch, so gaining better function by having bigger volume, you're then losing by doing a hand-sewn join. And if you did a, J a W pouch with a staple join, that might be the best of all worlds. But nobody ever did that in enough numbers to be able to analyse it properly.